appreciate everybody coming out uh, on a beautiful Happy Valley day. Um, just quickly go over uh, our players of the week uh, from last week on offense, Steven Gonzalez and KJ Hamler. Uh, on defense, Castro Fields and Parsons. And on special teams, the guy who's really doing a bunch of good things for us right now is Dan Chasina. We're very pleased with, with him and what he's doing for our program right now. Uh, getting into Michigan State, obviously a lot of respect uh, for their program, a lot of respect for Coach D'Antonio, the, the winningest coach in their, their program's history. Uh, been there for 13 years, um, and, and obviously a level of consistency that's impressive. Um, you know, probably you know one of the teams that returning um, uh, the most starters or, or up there in our conference in terms of number of starters coming back this season with nine on offense, eight on defense, and two on special teams. Um, you know, obviously, going on the road, tough place to play, um, <clears throat> and um, and looking forward to the opportunity. You, know, you talk about them offensively, uh, Brad Salem. You know they are. A combination of 11 personnel and 12 personnel. They will sprinkle some 21 personnel in there, but it plays very similar to 12. Uh, they're a zone read team. Uh, they're a um, stretch team. They're a power team. Um, guys that we're impressed with is Brian Lewerke, who's had uh, some of his best games against us. Uh, Cody White and uh, Darrell Stewart, both wide receivers that are doing some really good things for them. Uh, defensively, uh, between uh, Coach Tressel and Coach D'Antonio, you know, one of the better defenses in the country. Um, uh, I can speak for the six years that we've been here, very consistent in terms of how they play uh, defense at, at Michigan State and do it at a very, very high level. Uh, there are four down front. Uh, primary coverages, they'll play a combination of different two high coverages. Uh, quarters, uh, quarter, quarter, half, and cover two, and then a mix of, of one high, which is uh, you know some of their pressure pressure looks, whether it's man or, or fire zone, uh, 33 type stuff. Um, been impressed with their defensive end, number 48, Willicus, uh, has been a really good player for them. Uh, number 35, uh, Beachy, um, if I'm saying his name, I hope I'm saying his name correctly. And then uh, Raekwon Williams, number 99. It seems like those guys have been playing there forever. Uh, and then on special teams, Mark Statton. They do a really good job, um, especially when it comes to, to fakes and trying to steal a possession. Uh, we're going to be working all week like crazy. Um, uh, fake punts, um, onsides, kicks, things like that. They just always seem to have something in their package. Fake field goal. Um, They've run some pretty famous uh, fake field goals against people, um, so we need to spend time on, on all those looks this week. They do a really good job with those types of things. Uh, number 25, uh, again, their wide receiver, um, Stewart, uh, does a real good job in the return game for them. And then their linebacker, again, number 35, Joe Batchy, shows up a bunch. Batchy, Batchy, I say no. Okay. Um, so, appreciate you guys being here. Uh, obviously, I uh, want to thank the fans for last week um, as a 24-year uh, veteran of this profession and, and been on the planet for 48 years. Um, you know, those, those whiteouts and really home games in general uh, turned out to be really special. Um, you know, when you can get 110,000 people to show up for anything, uh, it's impressive and have everybody in that stadium uh, support in Penn State, the community, the university, specifically our football program, singing songs together, having fun, um, you know, is, is very, very special. So I uh, appreciate everybody coming out and supporting us and, and helping us, uh, you know, get a win. Uh, we're going to need that support on the roads, you know, on the road this week, um, you know, at Michigan State. So I ask uh, Penn Staters uh, far and wide. Um, to come and support us, wear white in the stadium, tailgate over there, uh, see a great venue, great road <coughs> venue, but come out uh, in not numbers. All the uh, alumni chapters, uh, really within hopefully a four hour radius of that place, can, can come and support us because we need you there. So, uh, open up the questions. Sarah Richard Garcella, Brandon Hill. 
Rich. Hello. Rich. Hello. Hey, we got you. Okay. I couldn't hear you. How you doing? Is there a How you doing? Offensive role How you doing, Rich? <laughs> hey, Rich. Hey, Rich. How you doing? Yeah, <laughs> and I just responded. I said, "How you doing?" I couldn't be back. Good. I didn't hear your question because I was just trying to say hi. Okay. Is there a common thread to your offensive woes from the last three games, and how much room is there for the offense to grow? Yeah, we can get better. We're looking at everything we possibly can do to get better. We're one and zero this past week. Um, and we got to be more consistent. Derek Lavar, Spokesman Translator. Hi, Derek Lavar. Hey, Derek. Derek, it looked like on uh, KJ's winning touchdown, uh, you're able to catch Michigan, Michigan with some tempo after getting a first down. Uh, Coach Harbaugh said they weren't able to get their signal in before the snap. What all goes into picking your spots uh, with your pace like that? And have you been able to use it as much as you'd like so far? Yeah, we, we want to mix tempo in. Um, I think it, that's one of the things I think we can do better. Um, there is times, you know, there is times where, um, you know, we try to go tempo, and because we don't do it all the time, um, our line is trying to look at their front and, and get comfortable with that before they get set. So um, it's one of those deals where if you're tempo all the time and you're going fast, 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 your players get used to that, but being able to turn it on and off um, is, I think, really the most valuable way to do it. Um, but it's hard to, to train it because it's because it's different, you know. So I think we can be better there. Um, you know, I think that was you know that was a, a really good example of of how your uh, tempo can be a weapon for you. Um, you know, but but you know, again, when you when you look at the tape, um, you know, they did get the signal in. Um, but you know, we just you know, we were able to go execute. Obviously, you know, being on the road causes some challenges as well, and things like that. But um, we were able to execute uh, at a high level and, and put one of our playmakers in position to make a play. All right, we'll give her a chance. How many calls? Hey, how are you? Good, Mark. How are you? Appreciate it. Where would you like to be more consistent offensively? Yeah, I, I think uh, consistency is, is about everything. It's about it's about you know, our run game. It's about our protection. It's about um, you know hitting the throws that we should hit consistently. Um, you know, it's it's all of it. It's it's third down. Uh, we've missed some opportunities. It's it's explosive plays. You know, but we played a defense this past class week. That's who they are. You know, if you look over the last I don't know how many years, that, that that's who they are. It's it's big plays against them. Uh, and if you're able to hit your big plays, you're going to have success. I think, you know, in the years that I look at them, I think Wisconsin is really the only team that's been able to line up and consistently, you know, run the ball and, <coughs> and have success. You know, there hasn't really been too many people that have been able to do that over the last number of years. Um, you know, even the Ohio State game was a bunch of big plays, a bunch of big plays. Frank Bodani, your daily record? Hi, James. Good afternoon, Ken. Hey, Frank. How are you? Real good. Real good. Your receivers, beyond KJ and um, Dotson, <clears throat> haven't had a whole lot of production catches at least from any of the other guys so far. Is that why is that? Is that is that a problem at all or not? Well, I, I think part of it is is you know we're rotating two guys at that one position. Um, you know, and, and part of it is like I like I mentioned before, when one of those guys has missed you know two games. Um, but again, it's you know it's it's the opportunities that present themselves, and you know when a team is a press team at the line of scrimmage, you're going to take some of the, the free access throws away. Um, you know that's going to create some different type of opportunities. You know in our slots and with our tight ends and things like that. So there's going to be weeks where those guys have a bunch of production. There's going to be weeks where where they don't, just depending on what the, the defense does. Obviously, in a perfect world, we would love to have everybody involved. Um, but again, you know, the most important thing for us is we want to be one and zero at the end of the week, which which we were this past week. Joe Giuliano, Phil Levin, Clark. Hi, James. Hey, Joe. Um, 
I don't think so. You guys averaged three penalties in each of the first three games, but you've averaged six in each of the next four, and uh, you're averaging more than 10 yards of penalty. Uh, uh, why is that? You feel that it's probably a, a, a case of too much aggressiveness, or uh, what is your message to the guys in, in penalties? Yeah, I think there's there's penalties that are are um, avoidable, and and those should never happen, ever. They're they're unacceptable. Um, but then, then there's aggressive penalties that are going to happen through a game. You don't want them to happen, but they're going to happen. But the thing I'm not going to do is I'm not going to come in here uh, and and you know, after a game uh, talk about talk about penalties. And the impact that they had on the game, and we've we've done that in the last couple of weeks. A bunch of questions about officiating. Um, the officials have a very tough job to do. Uh, each week, there's going to be calls that our opponent doesn't like, and there's going to be calls that we don't like. Um, I'm going to handle it through the process that the, the, the Big Ten has um, to be able to communicate, uh, you know, one on one, and to be able to send plays in and try to learn and try to go grow and try to coach my team and control the things that I can control, uh, but I'm not going to come into a press conference. I haven't really done that in six years. Um, and I'm going to try to avoid doing that and be respectful of the process and be respectful of, of the officials, but also um, I think it sends the wrong message to my team. I'm not, I'm not going to, I'm not going to come in after a game and, and, and talk about uh, calls or, or officials. Mike Gross on history newspapers. Hey Mike. Um, Sean Clifford was, was talking to us earlier. He, he talked about trying to figure out what kind of quarterback he wants to be and uh, how much emotion to show. He, he's excitable, but how much emotion to show when to pull it back a little bit. And I noticed on the other side of the ball, Micah seems like he's becoming more of a, uh, you know, motioning and moving guys around and stuff like that. How much of that do you coach and how much of that? has to sort of naturally evolve where you match a guy's personality with his role on the team. I didn't understand what you said about Micah. What is he doing? It looks like Micah is, is being more, uh, uh, you know, leading people, directing people around and stuff like that. And just being more verbal on the field. Okay. I didn't know if those were tied together, the emotion or the direct, and I guess that's what I'm, I'm trying to understand. Is it? Well, that might be a flaw in my question, James. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm not, I'm not trying to be. I'm not trying to just. I thought they were tied together, but they didn't seem to be. I'm not trying to be argumentative. I didn't understand, honestly. Oh, I know. I know. Okay, okay. Um, I guess the, the first thing is I think that's part of being a young player. Um, and obviously, it's magnified at the quarterback position, Sean, over time. Finding out what works best for him is it is it being emotional? Some guys have done it that way. Is it is it not showing a whole lot of emotion? Um, probably more have done it that way. Um, and and then I think there's kind of like a happy medium, you know, with those with those two things. And I think that's that's what playing and and, and having these experiences um, do for you. And I think myself and, and Coach Ronnie, that's our roles as well to kind of help him, help him with that. Um, I think there has been some games where he's been jacked up and juiced up, and I don't know if that's completely served him well at times. Um, but but you know, overall, I'm really pleased. You know, with, with Sean, um, you know, I really am. You know, he's been he's been really good. I see him growing. Every game, I see him growing. Every practice, I know how important it is to him. But most importantly, you got to be authentic. You got to be authentic as a coach. You got to be authentic as a player. Most importantly, you got to be authentic as a leader. And I think he's doing that. But I think him finding his sweet spot um, as a starting quarterback in the Big Ten and, and one of the leaders on our team, you know, I think he's he's that's that's going to be evolving. That's, that's going to he's going to learn something every game. That's learned something in terms of reading defenses. That's learning something in how he interacts with Coach Ronnie. That's with me. That's with his teammates. Uh, and that's with what's the most effective leadership style as well. And you know, and, and he's a very aware young man. So I think he's he's studying all those things. So um, I'm pleased with him. When it comes to Micah, uh, in the separate question that you asked. 
Um, just kidding, again. Um, yeah, I think he's getting more comfortable and more confident, you know, every day, and um, and taking more control. You know, I think the exciting thing for us and for Mike is I think he's got a lot of room for growth. I'm saying that after he had what 14 tackles, and I think fundamentally he can get a lot better. You know, uh, I think in terms of um, commanding the defense and leadership, he can get a lot better. You know, he is nowhere near his ceiling. You know, he really isn't, and um, and and he's improved dramatically. But the exciting thing is there's a lot more left in the tank in between um, Coach Pry um, and myself the rest of the defensive coaches and the strength coaches and, and some of the older guys like Jan Johnson and things like that. Um, you know, everybody's, everybody's helping um, uh, Micah. And to be honest with you, we're learning from Micah too. There's nobody that has more fun at meetings and there's nobody that has more fun on the practice field uh, than, and maybe in life than, than Micah Parsons. He, he has a good time, I'm telling you. Um, and he's, he's gotten really a lot better over the last year of knowing you know, there's a time and place for everything, which I think is a critical aspect for, for young players and a critical aspect for a team um, that we can know when it's time to have fun and know when it's time to enjoy ourselves. Excuse me, know when it's time to work and know when it's time to have some fun. Donnie Collins, Grand Times Tribune. How are you doing, Ken? Hey, Don. Hey, you mentioned a, a few times the last couple of weeks the offensive line and getting tougher grinding out games against some of the tougher defensive fronts in the country. How have you seen that ad that attitude develop this season and how much does the depth risk the youth are now contribute to that? I didn't hear that last part, I'm sorry. How much does the, the depth you're able to use there now contribute to that? Yeah, I think that we're playing more guys, I think helps us, you know, keep guys fresh. Um, you know, Dez gaining experience, you know, the rotation with Miranda and, and CJ and, and, you know, kind of different styles. I think that helps. I think the expanded uh, diversity in our running game, you know, over the last two years and, and, and a little bit more this year, I think that's helped us. Um, I think, you know, the different uh, running backs that we have, I think helps us. I think um, obviously, having a quarterback that can still you know, do some things with his legs as well. I think I think it's all those things, and obviously, you know, the, the biggest credit goes to our offensive line and, and um, Coach Lime Grover and Coach Ryan Reiner, excuse me, and um, you know, even Tyler Bowen, you know, factor in there as well. It's 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 all of it. Most importantly, it's it's you know the guys. Um, you know, when you got guys like. Gonzo, you got guys like Menon, you know, and you got guys like Fries that have played a lot of football for you. Um, you know, and them taking those other guys under their wing, I think I think that's been a big part of it as, as well. Um, so, you know, very, very pleased, you know, with that group overall, but we still we still got work to do. You know, we you know, obviously, you know, Michigan has got a real good front. You know, I know our defensive line felt like Michigan's interior three were the best that we've seen all, all year long, the guard and the centers. Um, and that's that's going to be how it's going to be all season. We're going to have another challenge this week. I mean, their their uh, defensive line and linebackers at, at, at Michigan State are really good. And they've been that way for a while. Corey Geiger, Elton Amir. Hi, Jake. How are you? Hey, Corey. Jimmy. We've asked you a lot of questions over the weeks about Noah Kane and his usage. Your answer has pretty much always been consistent that you have four backs that you like. I'm just curious, is, is there something that we're missing? Are we not asking the questions the right way? Because we all keep wondering, well, you use Noah in the in-game situation, and he's been effective, but then he only has five carries. So I'm just curious, is there, what is it that we're not seeing? Why is there a disconnect that we keep asking why he's not getting more usage, but we're not really getting you know, any more information? First of all, I want to say thank you. I think that's a very fair question, and I appreciate how, how, you, uh, uh, how you asked it. Um, yeah, there's always things that you guys are, are missing, and that's no disrespect to you guys, but um, we're, we're out of practice and in meetings for 16 plus hours a, a day and 
um, how to practice and watching everything. And you guys get 20 minutes a week to watch practice and then just the games. Uh, there's a, a thousand points that go into decision making. Um, but we got four backs that we really like, and uh, we'll continue to play those guys. Uh, we're very pleased with Noah. Um, actually had dinner with Noah last night. Um, my wife uh, was busting his chops. Uh, he's, been, he's been great. We're as pleased with him as you guys um, are, and we're as pleased with him as as the uh, as the fans are as well. But we're but we're also have a lot of confidence in those three other guys as well. So um, I get it. I, I get the question. Um, I think there's a lot of ways that you guys see us with young players, uh, a lot like Michael Parsons, who never started a game last year. Um, obviously, the differences is. is Mike had, you know, played starter reps, um, but we didn't have four guys at that position. So, um, you know, we're one and zero. We got, you know, we found a way to get a win last week against one of the more talented rosters in, in the country. Um, you know, against a, a really good football program, and um, Noah had a big part in that, and will continue to have a big part. And I think you're, you're going to see his role grow as the season goes on, or you're going to see. Another back, um, you know, take some steps as well. We'll we'll see. Well, there's questions here in the room. Raise your hand. We'll get a mic to you. Hi, James. How are you doing? Good. Great. I'm doing great. Uh, we have a chance to talk to Terry Smith later this week. I was wondering what went into or what goes into the assistant head coach title that he has, and can you speak to the value of having somebody with such deep ties to Penn State? He's kind of a generational guy uh, on the staff. Yeah, Terry's been invaluable to me. Um, you know, so kind of talk about Terry first besides, you know, the, the role. Um, Terry's just been invaluable because he knows Penn State inside and out. Uh, he's a three-generation you know, Penn State. His dad went to Penn State. Uh, Terry went to Penn State, played at Penn State, graduated from Penn State. And his son, you know, so he knows this place from so many different perspectives. He knows this growing up with parents that went to school here, like a lot. Seems like we have a lot um, of our students um, that, that parents went to school here. Um, he knows it as a student athlete, you know, uh, himself. Uh, and then he knows it as a parent of a recruit. He knows it as a parent of a player. And now, you know, as a coach, um, you know, for us as well. So. Um, you know, he's been phenomenal. You know, he's been a head coach, and been successful at that, highly successful. You know, he's um, you know, coached at a number of different colleges, and then we were able to bring him back home. And then, you know, in the, in the assistant head coach title, um, you know, Kevin, uh, excuse me, um, uh, Terry just does, does a great job for me being able to bounce things off of him. So, you know, Sean plays a role in that, Terry plays a role in that, and Dwight Galt plays a role in that. You know, and, and Terry's just got great perspective. You know, whenever we have our leadership council meetings, Terry's in there as well uh, to maybe bring a perspective that, that um, I didn't hit um, or to give me some feedback either before the meeting or after the meeting. Uh, he's developed great relationships with his players, He's tremendous in recruiting, highly, highly respected across the country, and obviously specifically the WPIL. Um, he's been a he's been a fantastic hire. One of the, one of the best decisions we we made was was hiring Terry Smith and and bringing his family you know, on on board here. And although I hope Terry gets some head coaching opportunities, uh, if that's what he wants, uh, because I think he's more than qualified to do that. Um, but if he doesn't, we sure would love him to retire here as a as a as a Penn Stater here with us, where he started, uh, and hopefully where he finishes. How are you? How are you doing, James? Good. How are you? Good. Um, I just want to ask about Dan Chisana. Um, how has he grown, kind of, in his role on special teams there, and what kind of teammate is he, in your opinion? Yeah, he's been he's been fantastic. You know, I think. Uh, I think you're going to see as the year goes on with him, you're going to see him continue to, to you know, gain confidence and, and make plays as a receiver for us. 
uh, right now, you know, let those two tackles he had last week on special teams were big. Uh, talking about, you know, obviously he can run, but there's a difference between running down and being able to break down and be able to tackle in open space against what most people would consider their best space player, which is the punt returner each week. And not an easy thing to do, um, but he's been great. You know, he uh, he's a high production, low maintenance guy. And that's really what you want your whole roster full of. Uh, it's not always that, that you know, that's not always the case, uh, but you want as many of those guys as possible. He's also a guy that we talk about a lot. He's also a guy that really appreciates uh, his role on the team and embraces his role on the team and wants to be the best uh, at his role on the team to help the team be successful. Um, does he want more? Yeah, they all do, but he handles it you know, really the right way. Um, so you know, we love him, you know, we do. You know, we recruited him out of high school and then, and then lost him to our track team for a period of time and then uh, are able to get him back and, and he's made a significant impact for us and we're glad to have him. Hey James, how you doing? Good, how are you? Good. <clears throat> Going back to your offensive line, uh, earlier today uh, your official Twitter account put out something about being on the Joe Moore Award. Uh, mid-season honor roll, most outstanding offensive line group. Rasheed Walker pretty quickly quote tweeted that and said, uh, the culture has changed in the offensive line room. Is that something that's identifiable to you? Are there characteristics or traits about this 2019 version of your offensive line that have maybe distinguished it a bit in your six years here? Yeah, you know, um, yeah, I think obviously, you know, we've, we've made great progress there. Um, you know, I think, I think, you know, Matt's done a really good job, especially in the off season and, and going visiting people and having people come and, and visit us. Um, I think it's it's the maturity that we have at the position. I think it's the talent that we have at the position. I think it's the depth that we have at the position. Um, I think it's a combination of all those things. I think Kevin Reiner, um, as a son of a letterman and, and as a former player, as a graduate transfer here, um, it brought value. I think Tyler Bowen, who's been an offensive lineman at this level, as well as a offensive line coach at this level in this conference, um, I think that's helped as well. Um, like, like, like you guys hear me answer a lot. It's, it's not really one thing. I think it's a combination of all of it, um, and I think it's also, like I said before, it's it's Gonzo and, and Bennett and Fries leading the group. Um, and, and taking a lot of pride in, in who and what they're going to be. We still got work to do, but um, you know, whenever you're recognized as, as part of a group that uh, is in consideration for the number one um, offensive line in all of college football, you know, obviously that's a good group to be a part of. But you know, for us, uh, you know, we want to we want to put our team in the best position to, to win games and be one and zero each week. Um, but we also, we also, you know, it'd be really cool, be a heck of a statement to be able to win that award. You know, and I know that's a goal that, that me and, and Coach uh, Lionel have been talking about, you know, for six years. Hey, James. How you doing? Good. How are you? Good. Um, well, working like Patterson had the, or has the ability to extend plays, does the coaching sort of change, from, not from the technique side, but maybe from the mental side with your secondary, so they they don't get frustrated, even though you have this great defensive line, they may be having to cover for five, six, seven seconds on some plays just because, um, like I said, Lavorky's ability to extend the play. No, I mean, you know, I, I think, you know, obviously you have to talk about, you know, the, the challenge when that happens, the challenge that comes when that happens is when a guy breaks contained and breaks the pocket and gets <coughs> on the edge, and now you have a defender in conflict. You see it all the time where, you know, the defender is in zone coverage, he's dropped back, he's underneath the route, but then the quarterback is running and he's got to make a decision. Do I come up and make the tackle? And if I do, then the ball's thrown over my head for completion. Or do I stay in coverage and allow the defensive line to catch it up? Or once he crosses the line of scrimmage, go make the tackle? It's hard though, because you see that guy, he's got nothing, you know, affecting his ability to pick up positive yardage. But you got to stay in coverage. So I think that's, that's the big thing. Um, you know, I think obviously the thing that you know helps eliminate that in the first place is, is doing a great job uh, with our rush lanes and our pocket integrity and not allowing the guy to get out in the first place. And that when we get our hands on him, that we finish it. You know, that we finish
finish the sack and we finish the play. So um, I think that I think that's going to be you know, really really important. But we just can't be screaming up the field and creating um, rush lanes if they if they're able to you know, cover us up and wash us out. You know we got to be great and we got to be great when we retrace and we stick our foot in the ground and, and chase the quarterback from behind. So it's 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 all of those things. But there's no doubt this guy has the ability to do that. Over here, how's it going? Yeah, but, when you go in a game and know there's going to be four or five, six drives that you're not going to score, are there benchmarks for that drive becoming successful either over the time of possession that you had the ball, maybe you're able to move it 30 yards, but then you have to punt anyway? What kind of, how can you mark success in those small failures? Yeah, you're talking about on offense. Yes. Yes, sir. Yeah, I think I think that's a really good question. You know, um, obviously we want to score every drive, and. and Trust me, I know the fans who want us to score every drive, and I know you guys also um, communicate that as well. Um, but I do think your point is a good one with the style of defense that we're playing right now. Um, it, it's, a, it's a win um, if the play ends with a kick, is something that I've always talked about. Um, my 24 years of doing this as an offensive coordinator, you want to be kicking an extra point after a touchdown. You want to be kicking a field goal for points. Or you want to be punting. Because if you don't turn the ball over, which is one of the better things that we're doing right now and one of the better things we've done all year long with the style of defense we're playing, we still have a chance to win the game, which is the ultimate you know, prize. Um, I think the next step, obviously, that I think we're also doing a really good job of is being able to punt people back deep into their own territory, into their own um, end zone, and into their own uh, end of the field. So it's not just kick a PAT, kick a field goal, or punt. It's being able to swing field position. So say we did start the ball on our own 10, and we're able to drive that thing out. Most people say if you're in a backed up situation, if you can get two first downs and punt and swing field position, you've won that that area, you know, that, that, that situation of, of football. Um, no different than when our defense has people backed up. You, know, you want to keep that field position. So we've, we've had a number of punts where I think uh, Blake's done a really good job of pinning people inside the 10 yard line, which the field position has been a big part of our success this year as well. And it's also skewed some of our punting numbers and punting ranking because we're moving the ball, you know. And when we do punt it, a lot of the times it's a sky punt situation rather than a traditional punt. So, yeah, I mean, uh, at the end of the day, you want to score 50 points a game. But there is definitely uh, wins when you can, when you can, at the very worst, Punt people deep into their own territory. Hey James, how's it going? Good, how are you? Good. Um, I think you talk a lot about explosive plays and creating explosive plays. How do you generate those versus a team that doesn't allow you to, or that plays in a way that won't allow for those big shots like we saw versus uh, Michigan? Yeah. How do you how do you take whatever they're giving you and then turn something into? Yeah, we've had both, and that's really changed over the years when it's pretty obvious how people are trying to defend us. Um, you know, after that Big Ten championship year, we saw a drastic change, and people said, we're not giving up the big play. We're going to keep everything in front uh, of us and not allow you to, you know, be one of the more explosive teams in the country. Um, you know, with that, that creates other opportunities. But then you have to have the maturity offensively to be able to take advantage of what the defense get, gives and really, in a lot of ways, morph your philosophy during the game once you see how they're playing. And the players embrace that style of play that you have to play as well. You know, the thing that's interesting is, you know, some of the some of the um, you know discussions that that we've had is it's it's like. People talk about, I think the first question I got today was the, the lulls. Well, people say, well, you stop being aggressive. How, how, does, how do people know that we stop being aggressive? Like, do, do they know the calls? You know, when we drop back and we get pressure and we had a, a shot called, and we either get sacked or pressured, the quarterback has to scramble or throw a check down and throw the ball away. Um, 
though those calls were very similar they were in the first quarter so i think all those things factor in they're they're on scholarship too you know that that's michigan's one of the more talented teams in the country and definitely one of the more talented teams in, in our conference so all of those things factor in but when you when you realize how a team is playing you either that opponent or as the season goes on when people see the things that have been successful we have to be comfortable um, as play callers and as players to be able to hit those underneath throws and we got to hit them more consistently third down and then the funny thing is that's where the explosive plays will come because the better we can throw accurately underneath and and throw the ball in a way that he can advance the ball we got guys that are athletic enough they're going to break a tackle and make people miss very similar to what we saw with john Dotson on the one crossing route um, so i think that's still there but also if you're going to play that style of secondary and play soft that creates more opportunities for explosive runs <coughs> as well so it's really a, a combination of all those things but the, for us I don't think it really has to do with that. It's just the consistency. We got to eliminate the plays where um, we've had a few, not many, where we miss ID the, the protection and we get pressured when we shouldn't, um, or they make a play and get pressure on us just because the guy made a play, um, or or we got to eliminate plays when we have a guy open and we don't hit them consistently. The, the long balls, we'd all like to hit 100 percent of them. You're not going to, um, but we got to try to hit as many of them as we possibly can because we all understand how impactful they are in the game. But it's the it's the third down and eight, and the tight ends wide open, and those you got you got to hit you got to hit 100 percent of the gimmies. Now the guy the ones that are in tight coverage, again you know they're on scholarship too, and, and we got to fight and find a way to win those battles. But the ones that are gimmies where we have worked like heck to protect and, and get a guy open, we got to hit him. And, and, and I don't want that to come off the wrong way. Um, I couldn't be more pleased with Sean. Um, but, but we got to hit a higher rate of those. Um, it's just like in the run game, we got to consistently mit, make the one free hitter. It's the safety or whoever it may be, we got to make that guy miss. Or it's the guy who's being blocked, but at the last minute falls off the block to make the tackle. <coughs> We got to sustain that block a half second longer to allow us to spurt through there. So, um, you know, it, it's those types of things. But it's us being critical of ourselves and 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 driving towards perfection. And that's us doing it. And it's also, um, you know, obviously uh, listening to you guys as well and, and, and your suggestions. <laughs> There's a bunch of them. And and the fans. Hey James, I just broke up. Good time. I wanted to, to go back to something for Saturday night uh, since you guys put it on film. The play where Journey called the fair catch looked like KJ was laying down in the end zone. It was the plan to get the ball back to him, assuming it was a mature going for Yeah, as you can imagine, um, you know, I'm not going to get into the scheme and plans that we had because. Uh, we, we do things to set things up for that game. We do things to set things up for the future. So it doesn't make a whole lot of sense for me to you get it. Because huh? it, it was on film, that's why I thought maybe they had it. In. Yeah, it's all yeah. on film. So you have an opportunity right. to yeah, see it, and, 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 and so, do the, so do the opponents have opportunity to see it. But for me to get into the reason why we did it, um, I don't think it, it's in our best. You know. so my question about it, though, is because we've seen other teams use it. It's been around for a while. Um, but some teams have been penalized for it because when a guy's down, they assume he's hurt, that kind of thing. Have you guys seen that consistently call the crossbow? I think the rule is you you can't you can't um, you can't get down late. Okay. But if you drop down after the excuse me early, you if you get down after the ball's been kicked, you're fine. You can't you can't do it. So if you read a rule book, there's a very specific okay. way you can do so it that makes it legal, and a way that's not. And we looked into that in great detail before. We James, a lot of times when people talk about success in special teams, they're talking about return yardage. Um, but on the flip side of that, how would you evaluate your teams limiting um, teams on both punt and kick return yardage? Yeah, I think I think we've been good. Um, we can we can be better. I think again, I think the stats can be a little bit deceiving, especially in punt. 
um, because we're pitting people deep uh, a lot of times with sky punts and things like that. Um, but kickoff return, punt return, what we have done this year probably better than years past is um, we haven't had any <coughs> catastrophic plays. The kickoff return for a touchdown, the punt return for a touchdown, the explosive return uh, that swings momentum and field position. I think we've done a good job there, uh, but we can be better. I think the biggest thing we have to do is we have to eliminate the penalties you know, on special teams. We've had too many penalties on special teams um, you know, that obviously the, the penalty on Saturday, you know, we had a kickoff return for a touchdown on a double team. Like, you don't need to hold on a double team. You know, we, we, we had the guy blocked anyway. It wasn't going to make tackle. You know, so we just, we just got to be smart uh, because, you know, the, those, those penalties are, are impactful. Um, you know, again, I think we've done a pretty good job overall. Uh, we've been one of the more disciplined teams in, in college football. There's been games. Where those those have spiked up, um, which is which is interesting. James, I uh, see you're the recipient of the Renaissance Award, a big award here in the State College. Uh, can you say what it means to you, and is it an indication uh, of uh, an you know uh, an embrace, a community embrace, and vice versa? Have you embraced? Me? Um, <laughs> I've day one, you thought. I have a you too. <laughs> All the way back to that banquet, and now you know. Yeah. It seems like a generation ago. Yeah. You explained the kale style. That's right, that's right. Um, yeah, it's, it's cool. Um, it, it really is. Um, you know, something that was brought up actually a year ago, and it just was hard to do, as you can imagine, you know, um, you know with our schedule. So once we planned it out long enough, we could find a weekend that kind of worked for everybody, or a week that worked for everybody. But yeah, it's um, you know, it's it's a tremendous honor, and I think you know for us when you're able to get involved in and being a part of scholarships that are going to make a difference in someone's um, college experience and maybe open up some opportunities for college experience. Um, I'm a first generation college you know student. I, my mom, dad, or sister didn't didn't go to college. Um, I know how impactful uh, you know my my little scholarship that I got to East Stroudsburg, as well as, as being a full Pell guy. Um, you know, it's it's significant. So um, you know, for us, it's more about that. It's more about the servant leadership. It's more about the giving. Um, is it is it cool to be recognized? Um, yeah, and, and and we appreciate it as a family. Um, but, but most importantly, it's about hopefully being able to make an impact and, and raise a bunch of money uh, for the Renaissance Fund to allow as many kids to be able to come to Penn State on scholarship and, uh, or some form of scholarship and maybe take the burden off of their, off of their families. And, and we're blessed that we're fortunate in a position to be able to help do some of those things. We'd like to do more of those things. Um, but, you know, my, my wife worked in higher ed. She's got her master's degree. Um, I was a first generation college student that was, ended up getting a master's degree. Um, so education is something that's very, very important to me and my family. And I know, I know how important it is to, to this community. So, so we're excited about it. It's, it's, uh, it's a little strange for me, um, but it's something that's, that's very, very important. And this is a place I think over our history, uh, whether it's THON or whether it's you know, all the different types of scholarships and giving that, that have happened in this community on this campus, uh, we're, we're, we're excited to be a part of it. Two more, Josh. Uh, James, you mentioned Michael Parsons a little bit earlier. Is there anything he can do on the field anymore that, that would surprise you? And you mentioned this high ceiling. Just how high is that ceiling? You know, I, you know, I don't know about that, um, but I just know Micah has gotten a lot better fundamentally you know, from this time last year, um, but he's still making a lot of plays just on athleticism and, and instincts. And I think as his fundamentals and technique continue to improve um, and his understanding of the game at that position, which is still fairly new to him, 
Um, it, it's hard to say where he can go as he continues to mature. Um, it's all of it, you know. So it, it's hard to say because literally, I don't think he's anywhere close. I don't think he's anywhere close um, to to his ceiling. I don't, I don't think he's. I don't think he's anywhere close. And and I don't want that to come off the wrong way because um, I think he's you know one of the better players in, in college football. But um, this is all still very new to him, and um, he's embraced the, the the techniques and the fundamentals and things like that of the position. Um, but I think he can be even better there. So, um, you know, I'm excited to watch him get better uh, this year. I'm, I'm, I'm excited to watch him get better over his career. And I know Coach Pride does a great job of working with him. And I know they have a very close relationship, which helps. Uh, but, you know, Mike is a fun, very lovable, fun guy to coach. Um, it drives you crazy a little bit sometimes, too. But um, always kind of in, in, in a fun, loving uh, way. Hey, James. Antonio Shelton seems to be one of the more vocal guys on the defensive side. When did you see that trait in him kind of develop, and how have you seen him grow as a leader both on and off the field? You know, uh, he's, he's really been really been good. I think all the way back to when we first got involved with Antonio, I remember beating him and his mom um, at a Buffalo Wild Wings in Columbus, Ohio, I think is where it was. And uh, that was kind of our, our home visit with him and, and kind of went through everything and got off and late and we were able to get him here. And uh, He's a smart guy. He's a very strong guy, powerful. Um, and he just continues to work, you know, and, and his improvement from the time he got here to now is, is significant. I mean, it's really impressive. Um, it's funny, I'm sitting in my office you know, yesterday, he just comes and plops down on the couch and just talks to me for 45 minutes. And I was like, Antonio, I gotta go over meeting. And I just left him in there, you know, he just was in there you know, on the phone or whatever. But the relationship that he's built with Coach Spencer and the defensive coaches and really the whole staff and myself, um, he's not a, a guy who's afraid to speak his mind, which I think is really good. Um, he's not a guy that's afraid to come into my office and have you know an honest conversation uh, with me, which I want more than. I want more guys comfortable walking in my office because if you're not careful as a head coach, every time you call someone to come to your office, it's like going to the principal's office. Um, so you know he's been he's been great. You know um, he's he's obviously active on, on social media. Um, there's sometimes I wish that we were less active on social media, not just Antonio, but all of us. I'd love to see us kind of shut it down for the rest of the season. Um, I'd love to hand mine over to the, the our, our social media uh, department and let them just kind of handle it all. Um, we talk about sacrifices, that would be something that would be great. Uh, but Antonio's been, he's been, he's been awesome. You know, we're, we're very, very proud of him. He's done great in school. Um, I think he is someone because of how his recruiting process went. I think he's very appreciative uh, of his Penn State experience. He doesn't take it for granted. Um, it's interesting though that you, you brought that up, and I'm gonna I'm gonna branch off because it just it made me think of, of something else when you asked that question. Um, these things aren't really connected, but uh, you know, Tom Bahali was the first time that, that we got to spend some time around him. This weekend, he'd been around, but this was the first time we spent a significant amount of time, and he spoke to the team, and I got to spend a bunch of time with him, and, and um, you know, being our honorary captain and, and his children, which I offered them all, even the three-month-old. Um, but Tamba's humility was one of the most impressive things I've ever been around. I, you know, you, you introduce him to the team and you put all of his accolades and his resume is as impressive as anyone. And he got up and talked to the team. And some guys get up and talk to the team and they wow the room because they're dynamic. 
he wowed me and wowed the room because of his humility. I mean, it was unbelievable. And really, his message was was to um, to talk less and listen more. Um, and just the way he said it and the way he went about his business uh, was really, really impressive and, and left a huge uh, impression on me. And he still owns a place here in, in Happy Valley, so I'm hoping he'll come back more. Um, I think you guys have heard me talk about before, that was something I think over the last year and a half, or maybe last three years, we made significant progress in is forever those guys could come back and it was family. And it, had been, it was so much change in such a short period of time uh, that we lost some of that. And I think we've made tremendous progress there. The guys that have come back uh, that have given us a chance to get to know us and for us to get to know them, it's been really good. And Tombo was another great example of that. So um, I, I want him back as, as much as possible because I think he'd be just a tremendous mentor to our guys, and uh, you can see why this place was so successful for so long. When you can get those type of people to join your family, join your program, because uh, he's a he's a culture driver in every sense of the world. You can see why the Chiefs. I think he was part of the Chiefs organization for like twelve years. You could you can see why it was more guys don't last for twelve years based on just sacking the quarterback. You know, um, you could tell he was a guy that was just universally respected in the locker room from the players and you know anybody in the organization. It's just those guys, those guys in any organization are just invaluable. Thank you.